we're back. It's Eric Hyatt again with another lecture for my Oceanography 328, 528 class. Today we're focusing in on the structure of ocean crust, lithosphere, and the further developments in plate tectonic theory. This is really cool and interesting stuff, so let's get going. So ocean basins and plate tectonics, and we've been working through these series of discoveries of how the oceans work and how these discoveries came to be. So far, we've focused on the Earth's large-scale structure and not too much detail, but we've discussed the importance of the outer core, the convecting mantle, and then the rigid lithosphere and convecting underlying asthenosphere. This diagram is a very simplified cartoon of the structure of the Earth, but it does a good job in terms of discriminating the phase chains or mechanical layers on the right, so lithosphere, asthenosphere, and then that placeholder mesosphere for most of the mantle, outer core and inner core. And that contrasts with the compositional boundaries inside the Earth, and that is the crust, the mantle, and the core. It's important to note that the lithosphere contains two compositional layers, the crust, and then a little bit of mantle that's frozen underplating the crust. So the lithosphere has both components. That'll become important in just a few minutes. We've touched on briefly the density differences inside the Earth, but also at the surface of the Earth, we've spoken about uh, seawater composition and water density, and pure water has a density of one, Seawater is slightly more dense, about 3% denser than fresh water, 1.035. Sediment, depending on the amount of water, has variable density from about 1.5 for very water-rich sediment to about 2.6 for water-poor sediment. The ocean crust is first composed of pillow basalt, volcanic extrusive texture that forms on the deep seafloor. We talked about that before. Because of the fractures and the glassy texture and the alteration, its density is quite variable. But 2.4 to 2. Point, really 2.8, depending on solid basalt there is. And then ocean crust in general, because it's the lower part of the ocean crust is crystalline, mafic rock or gabbro, its overall density is 2.9. Then we drop down, we go through a big compositional change to the upper mantle. And the upper mantle, the solid part, has a density of 3.3 grams per milliliter. Molten, hot, circulating mantle, the asthenosphere, the more rapidly circulating, partially molten upper mantle, has a density of 3.3 to 3.2 which makes it about 10% lighter than solid mantle. And then the, the overall mantle is 4.5 grams per milliliter. The outer core is 9.5, and the inner core is a freaking 13 grams per milliliter. There's a lot of mass in the core of the Earth, outer core and inner core. These density differences play a big role in plate tectonics. The hot, partially molten, part of the asthenosphere that's convecting has a density that's about 10% lower than the rest of the upper mantle, it rises up and causes uplift underneath the mid-ocean ridges. That density difference just there causes the uplift of the mid-ocean ridges and affects the shape of the mid-ocean ridges. Likewise, as ocean lithosphere moves away from the mid-ocean ridge, it cools, but it's also getting more and more underplating of that solid asthenosphere. And once that asthenosphere cools a bit and crystallizes to the bottom of the ocean crust, you have a greater density, more approaching 3.3 grams per milliliter. And that causes a drive to pull down. And this, this phenomenon is called slab pull into the mantle. So we have ridge uplift causing a push on the ocean crust. And then we have pulling as the downgoing lithosphere becomes more dense and cools and sinks back into the mantle. So we have both forces operating, ridge push from uplift and slab pull from sinking. But as I've mentioned to you previously, this difference in ocean crust mantle 
and continental crust gives us the ocean basins. All of these solid materials sitting at the surface, the solid lithosphere, is riding on that squishy, partially melted, weak asthenosphere. And continental crust, as I've mentioned before, is thick, up to about 50 kilometers thick. Its composition is more differentiated, more separated elements from even the ocean crust. So it's very light, relatively. So relatively, it's light. It has a low density compared to ocean crust and compared to the mantle. It has a high concentration of aluminum, sodium, silica, oxygen, and potassium. So it contains a relatively high abundance of light elements. So its density is lower, it's thicker, and therefore, when it's floating, in the asthenosphere, the upper mantle, it rides higher, and its average elevation of the Earth's surface is almost a kilometer above sea level. Ocean crust, on the other hand, is thin, less than 10 kilometers thick normally, has a higher density with more iron and calcium and less aluminum than the continental crust, and so it rides lower in the asthenosphere and its equilibrium point for floating in that asthenosphere is almost minus four kilometers. It's minus 3.8 kilometers below sea level. This is what gives us the ocean basins in the first place and continents. That's what co creates the contrast. So let's next look at ocean crust composition and heat or heat flow through the ocean crust. And we'll start with the actual physical structure of the crust start out with the fact that it's part of the lithosphere. So let's look at a cross section through the upper lithosphere that's mostly focused on the ocean crust. And oceanic lithosphere includes part of the mantle, that frozen upper part of the mantle. And in this little sketch, I'm, I included just the upper little sliver of that part of the mantle. As I mentioned to you before, it has a very iron and magnesium rich composition. And the mineral that mostly forms is actually olivine, that green mineral, and a rock made of mostly olivine is called peridotite or peridotite. Gemstone variety of olivine is the gemstone peridot. And so this is called peridotite because it's, and so we look at the boundary between the two, and this is the moho, this is that discontinuity that defines the boundary of the mantle and the crust. And so we have the, the ocean crust above crystalline ocean crust. So it has the texture of a granite, cooled very slowly beneath the surface, and that is gabbro. The material that reaches it reaches the surface or near the surface forms basalt. And we, the first thing we have are feeder dikes. So they're, they're like tubes or pipes feeding mafic magma to the surface. And when it cools and fills the, and when the magma cools very quickly, it leaves basalt. We have sheeted dikes, and dikes are vertical structures in the igneous, in igneous rocks. And wherever that magma reached the surface and flowed out on the surface, it forms those volcanic textures in cold pressurized water. It makes big blobs of lava that cools, and those are called pillow basalts. So the basalt is not just a flat flow that flows out. It tries to flow out, and it cools into kind of a big um, loaf of bread kind of shape, typically a meter across and maybe a meter to two meters long. Might have a little bit of sediment on top with a low density. So here's our density structure for the ocean lithosphere. One and a half to two and a half roughly, 2.7, 2.8, 2.8 for the sheet of dike part, the more solid part, 2.9 for solid crystalline mafic material, gabbro, pritotite, distinctly different uh, density at 3.3. We've only recently drilled with the drill ship, the Chikyu, into the deeper part of the ocean crust and into the mantle, the upper solid part of the mantle. This was first recognized in a rock sequence called an ophiolite. And so ophiolite. And that is a little bit of ocean crust and lithosphere that's been pushed up and is exposed. So we think of subduction as being subducted, material going down into the mantle. Often though, with collision of ocean crust and ocean crust, 
and sometimes ocean crust and even continents, a little wedge of ocean crust and lithosphere will be forced up. And that's the process is called abduction or abducted oceanic lithosphere. There's a few places around the Earth that have exposure of this. There's, there's some in the Middle East. People have studied the sequence from exposed peridotite to the gabbro layer and you can walk up into the sheeted dike layer and actually see ancient pillow basalts. Today, we have a much better handle globally on the thicknesses and where these boundaries are because we look at earthquake uh, seismic wave behavior. And so let's say if we have an earthquake in the ocean crust near the surface and that sends down seismic waves, seismic waves as we spoke about before increase in velocity with increase in density. So an earthquake would generate seismic waves that gain a little bit of velocity until they hit this sheet of dike layer and then they gain a bit more velocity and they bend at these interfaces just like light bends when it hits from air to water, it refracts. These seismic waves increase in speed through the gabbro layer, but when they hit the peridotite layer, we see a big change in velocity because we have a big change in density, a, a much higher density. So what I've plotted here are the seismic wave velocities in kilometers per second and depth. And we see the behavior of these seismic waves as they drive down into more and more dense material into the earth. This discontinuity in seismic waves defines the core man mantle boundary and that's called the, the moho or moho of Arichic discontinuity. When we move away from the mid-ocean ridge and this graph shows the distance from the axial valley of the mid-ocean ridge the heat flow through the ocean crust should be an exponential decay, a cooling curve. As ocean crust and ocean lithosphere move away from the upwelling center of the asthenosphere off of the mid-ocean ridge, it cools and gains density. If we looked at the heat flow from an idealized perspective, the greatest heat flow is at the mid-ocean ridge, basically on the axial valley and it would start out with about 250 milliwatts per square meter and then it forms an exponential cooling curve as it moves kilometers away up to a couple thousand kilometers away from the mid-ocean ridge it's gaining density because it's cooling the whole way and we see that actually with depth curves we've seen this before in terms of the mid-ocean ridge is a topographic high and so its depth in like if we take the case example of the Atlantic, the depth of the mid-ocean ridge out in the center of the Atlantic is about two kilometers deep. And then as you move away with distance, it sinks into the asthenosphere because it's cooling and it's gaining underplating of mantle material, very heavy, 3.3 grams per milliliter. It's gaining weight essentially and sinking back into the asthenosphere so it gets deeper. And so if you look at the depth distribution in the Atlantic, the mid-ocean ridge is about two kilometers deep, but then the deepest part of the Atlantic over by the continents is on the order of four to five kilometers deep. When oceanographers and geologists started actually taking measurements on the ocean floor and and testing these kind of theoretical heat curves, gaining more and more data, they found something very troubling. The actual heat flow through the mid-ocean ridges should follow that exponential cooling curve from 250 to 300 milliwatts per square meter, and it should decay down exponentially as we move away. Actual measurements on the mid-ocean ridges and very near the axial valley of the mid-ocean ridges showed that there was a heat deficit. So the actual, the theoretical here is shown in red and it's just an exponential cooling curve, but the actual measurements follow a trend something like this in this purple line where there are big heat deficits. And so the mid-ocean ridges were actually cooler than they expected. So when they started to develop the plate tectonic model, looked at the temperature that the asthenosphere would be and the asthenosphere welling up and erupting onto the seafloor at the mid-ocean ridges, 
and then considering the thickness and the composition of the mid-ocean ridge itself, we should have a, a heat flux curve through that ocean crust that follows the red line. But the actual measurements when, when they put temperature probes on the ocean crust at the mid-ocean ridges, the rock was actually cooler, much cooler than they expected. It really caused people to wonder what's going on and where is this, this heat that should be there? Why are the mid-ocean ridges a lot cooler than they should be? And then once you get away from the, the actual ridge itself, the ocean crust has a little bit of excess heat. So it's actually warmer than, than they predicted. This pattern occurred in almost every ocean basin, every mid-ocean ridge that they looked at. So the Indian Ocean, the yellow shows kind of this missing heat. The red line is the idealized cooling curve that we should be seeing on the mid-ocean ridge and away from the mid-ocean ridge. And the green dots with the error bars, vertical error bars of heat flow, show that there's a gap. The mid-ocean ridges are cooler than they should be. This question of where is the missing heat? Why are the mid-ocean ridges cooler than we would expect them to be? It was this discovery that the mid-ocean ridges were considerably cooler than they should have been, in theory, that prompted Bob Ballard and other oceanographers and geologists to go looking for where the heat is going. And in 1977, Bob Ballard, a famous oceanographer and geologist, launched a mission to the mid-ocean ridge in the Pacific, called the East Pacific Rise, and they were using the submersible Alvin that we spoke about before. And they went down to the mid-ocean ridge and they found some really bizarre structures on the seafloor of the mid-ocean ridges. When they reached the seafloor on the mid-ocean ridge, they found some very bizarre structures, these hydrothermal vents. And they called them black smokers because the effluent coming out of these vents looks like black smoke. But in fact, it's not smoke, it is um, mineral particles. And if you think back, the true color of pyrite or fool's gold when you powder it is black. And these are little tiny particles, microscopic particles of pyrite and other sulfide minerals. And they're all make a black color and they're precipitating in the water as this hot water comes out of the hydrothermal vent and hits the cold seawater, which is near freezing. The water coming out of the vents was 350 degrees C or about 600, 650 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt parts of Alvin. And they almost had a very bad incident. They almost ran into one of these. And if they had, they speculated that they would have melted the windows, which were made of six inch thick kind of plexiglass material on Alvin but it did melt part of the side a little bit of the submersible, but luckily they made it back. The cold water from the ocean, which is near freezing, circulates down through fractures in the pillow basalts and the fractured volcanic basaltic rocks, and it heats up because the asthenosphere is not far away and it's 1500, maybe as low as 1200 degrees C, and it sets up a hydrothermal circulation through the fracture system. And then the hot water comes shooting out some of the fractures, these hydrothermal vents. And so they went down and they actually sampled some of the, the material that was making up the hydrothermal vents and sampled some of the life. They discovered whole new ecosystems that hadn't been seen before on the planet. And the, the sulfur chemistry that's operating due to the hydrothermal circulation is the source of energy that all the life is based on. So it's not based on photosynthesis and the sun's power, it's based on chemical power. And that chemical power comes from the asthenosphere. It comes from the earth itself. So they discovered a whole new ecosystem on the seafloor. And so here's a couple cartoons that show uh, a hydrothermal vent, a black smoker with fractures, and this pile of brown material and sometimes builds up a chimney looking structure is made out of sulfide minerals. 
like iron sulfide, pyrite, and copper iron sulfide, and zinc sulfide, and lead sulfide, and there's gold and platinum and other elements combined in here, in this, this material, in this structure. The fracture system is housed in the fractured basalt. That's part of the mid-ocean ridge system, and the hydrothermal vent is sitting over here on the side. And this diagram shows cold seawater coming down, getting heated up, and circulating out. Here's another diagram that kind of shows the same thing, but on a bigger scale. Cold seawater coming down through the fractures and the pores in the rock and getting heated up. And then it comes exiting out, rising up because it's very hot. But the hot seawater dissolves a lot of elements from the basalt and mobilizes them to the surface where most of them actually precipitate when that hot water hits the cold water of the seawater and a lot of the, the elements precipitate out as in minerals. Here's a cartoon that I drew uh, that kind of shows the process with the heat source here. About 1500 degrees C coming up to the surface, feeder magma pipes coming up through the sheeted dike layer to the pillow basalt layer, and then series of fractures coming off as these two halves separate. So you get some very characteristic kind of fault structures here. And I've, I've drawn a little bit of sediment starting to accumulate on the seafloor as it moves away from the mid-ocean ridge. And so it'll gradually get more and more sediment piled on top of the ocean crust and the ocean lithosphere. So here's the mantle up to this green line. So it's the peridotite layer. And here's the base of the ocean crust made of gabbro, crystalline rock, the sheet of dike layer, and the pillow basalt layer. So in an idealized world, the heat flow looks like this, but the actual rocks are water cooled, just like your car. So these hydrothermal systems act like a radiator to cool the ocean crust. And that's where the missing heat is going. The heat is going into the water, not the rocks themselves. As I mentioned before, the cooling of the ocean crust as it moves away from the, the convecting upwelling center of the asthenosphere, it cools and it gains density as it moves away from the mid-ocean ridge. And the ocean actually gets deeper as it moves away from the mid-ocean ridge. But I wanted to jump back and I wanted to point out something to you that ocean basins can have different seafloor shapes due to the spreading process. And the mid-ocean ridge in the Atlantic is nice and steep with an axial valley. These are some of the data profiles that Marie Tharp used to sketch out the seafloor in the different ocean basins. This represents some more of the more recent and more complete data for the Pacific, and there is no axial valley in the East Pacific rise in the Pacific. But what I wanted you to especially notice is the shape of the East Pacific rise. It's very broad and wide and uplifted in a large area in the Pacific relative to the Atlantic. The Atlantic has a nice high, narrow, rapidly declining profile. And I mentioned this to you before, but this is because the spreading rate is about half in the Atlantic relative to what it is in the Pacific. So the Pacific spreading rate is about five to six centimeters per year, and the Atlantic is about an inch or about two to three centimeters per year. This rate difference means that the Atlantic Ocean crust is cooling and sinking into the asthenosphere in a shorter distance away because it's spending more time cooling. The East Pacific rise is moving twice as fast. It doesn't have as long to cool and sink back into the asthenosphere. So you get a very wide, tall profile for a mid-ocean ridge in that case. Before we leave this topic, I want to show you a little bit of the physical attributes of rifting and ocean basin formation. Number one, let's. the first thing is rifting and uplift in general is driven by movement in the asthenosphere, essentially convection. And so that's this upper part, this red part 
on this diagram. So you have inner core, outer core, mantle, most of the mantle or mesosphere, and then we have a little bit of a stenosphere and then a very, very thin. Previously, I mentioned to you the importance of this rapidly circulating outer core, and I contrast that with Mars, which, because it's much, much smaller than the Earth, we think its outer core is frozen, and it, its magnetic field is generated by essentially a remnant magnetism of the outer core. The Earth, in contrast, has this rapidly circulating outer core, which generates a very, very strong magnetic field but also the mantle is moving and circulating very, very slowly. And then the upper mantle, the asthenosphere, is partially molten, kind of a thick plastic kind of a state, is, and is moving, and that especially drives plate tectonics. But the question is, where is all the heat coming from that makes the interior of the Earth so dynamic? The answer is there's another heat source inside the Earth besides the remnant heat of the Earth. And we've got radioactive elements that adds heat to the mantle and the upper mantle especially, uranium and thorium and even radioactive potassium. And these break down or undergo radioactive decay into more stable daughter products. In that process, a little tiny bit of mass is lost during the radioactive decay process. And Albert Einstein pointed out that energy is released in proportional to the mass that's removed. Now the mass removed is minuscule, very, very tiny. But if there's a constant that you multiply this mass by, and that's the speed of light. And the speed of light is fast. So that's a very large number and then you square it. So it's the square of a very large number. In kilometers, that's 300,000 kilometers per second. So you end up with a very large number to multiply by the little tiny bit of mass that's lost, and you get a very, very large amount of energy, much of it in the form of just heat. And that extra energy source is adding heat to inside the Earth, and that particularly keeps the mantle and the upper mantle or asthenosphere moving. So we have the heat source, we have the movement inside the mantle. Now, what sets off rifting in the first place? To a large degree, it's the heat and the resulting density differences that are caused by it. And I made a, a simple sketch here where we have the upper upwelling upper mantle or asthenosphere moving around and it has 10% less density than the surrounding mantle, a density of about 3.3 grams per milliliter. That density difference causes uplift, which causes the overlying crust to fracture and separate. We call that rifting. An interesting aspect of these density differences are that when this upwelling of the asthenosphere occurs, this density difference causes uplift of the region and the overlying crust fractures and separates and causes rifting. But it's important to point out that before a basin, like an ocean basin forms, there's often periods of tens of millions of years, often 50 millions of years of uplift of the region. We see that in the geologic record of East Africa. So East Africa has been uplifting and separating for many tens of millions of years. There's been volcanism and uplift with mountains and volcanoes forming. If the rifting continued, it will eventually open up and drop below sea level like the Red Sea has done. But that's way in the future, and it appears based on plate tectonic models that's not gonna occur. Convergence of Africa moving northward again is going to close up those rifts, including the Red Sea. The Red Sea is probably gonna close. So when rifting starts, we have this period of uplift and we have land, and at some point, we'll start to get lakes in the Rift Valley. And we see that in East Africa. There's a, a whole series of lakes in the East African Rift Valley. Not ocean water, but freshwater lakes. And we have this period of uplift and separation at the initial stage of rifting. I mentioned to you before that you get some interesting fracturing and the term for this, the type of fault that you get is called a listric fault and that's a fault that forms 
at a high angle at the surface and then it kind of curves into the, the crust. It could be continental crust or it could be ocean crust. And it forms a series of blocks that drop down and rotate, they kind of rotate down. We see that on the flanks of the Re Red Sea today. We see it in the East African Rift. You can see these on the margins in the subsurface of continents today. So Lystric faults. Rifting continues and we have the Red Sea phase. So juvenile rift basin. Now we could have the, the bottom, we can have the bottom of the rift now dropping below sea level, like the Red Sea. We have a shallow seaway in here. We would have hydrothermal vents on the seafloor and that's exactly what's happening in the center of the Red Sea. And then the ocean basin continues to separate and evolve. The ocean crust is cooling and getting deeper and deeper and it gets more sediment piled on top. And as you approach the continents, if we look in the subsurface, we've got a messy case here of fracturing, altered basalt, and mixed with sediment. And the example today is the Atlantic Ocean Basin in the mature stage. So here's a cross section through that mature stage. Here's the mid-ocean ridge, upwelling asthenosphere. So we have this uplifted region providing a gravity uplift and we have pushing across and the flanks here, we don't have subduction in the Atlantic Ocean Basin. We just have simply pushing across, pushing across the continental crust. This could evolve into a subduction zone particularly if this spreading rate increases in the Atlantic. We could develop a subduction zone along the margins of the Atlantic in the future with volcanoes and everything else. But right now, it's just simply pushing across, pushing the continents apart. In the mature ocean stage, the continental crust and the intersection with the ocean basin is really messy. So we can see old ocean crust here with lystric faults sliding down. These have stabilized but they still see poor water movement through them. We still see alteration of the ocean crust and the basalt, and this becomes more and more amalgamated and kind of indistinct because the basalt and the gabbro is turning to clay and it's becoming quite altered, getting buried in sediment as it approaches the edge of the the basin. And today, to track continental movement and plate tectonics, very accurate GPS stations like this one are anchored to the Earth's surface. We can track to a millimeter scale of movement per year. So now all the continents and ocean basins largely are known in terms of how fast and what directions they're moving. So we have the advantage today of having the technology to actually measure the movement and the direction. So that's it for today. That wraps up this section of ocean basins. So I'll leave you with some crab antics and I'll see you next time.